All right. Plasma oncotic pressure, also known as colloid oncotic pressure or oncotic pressure, is responsible for keeping fluid inside the vessels. A force is generated inside the vessels by large plasma proteins, especially albumin, that attracts water and other fluid. This is the opposite of hydrostatic pressure. Oncotic pressure exerts a pull inside the vessel. A hot oncotic pressure would pull fluid from outside the vessel through the vessel wall and into the vessel. Alright, a high hydrostatic pressure pushes fluid out. A low hydrostatic pressure pushes less fluid out of the vessel. A high oncotic pressure draws excessive amounts of fluid into the vessel. And a low oncotic pressure does not exert an adequate pull effect to counteract the push of hydrostatic pressure. To have an adequate blood pressure in perfusion, the myocardium must work effectively as a pump. The heart can vary in its output to meet a wide range of physiological demands. It can drastically increase its pumping function up to six times. The pump functions function is typically expressed as the cardiac output. All right. The cardiac output is defined as the amount of blood injected by the left ventricle in one minute. The heart rate is defined as the number of times the heart contracts in one minute. The heart has the property of automaticity, meaning it can generate its own impulse. The sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system exert control over the heart rate through the cardiovascular control center located in the brain stem. An increase in stimulation by the sympathetic nervous system increases the heart rate. This is like your fight or flight, okay? A decrease in stimulation by the sympathetic nervous system decreases the heart rate. And it's pretty much the opposite with the parasympathetic, okay? Stroke volume is defined as this volume of blood ejected by the left ventricle with each contraction. Stroke volume is determined by the preload, myocardial contraction, and afterload. So what exactly is preload? Preload is the pressure that is created by the blood volume in the left ventricle at the end of diastole. <coughs> the available <clears throat> venous volume plays a major role in determining preload. <coughs> An increase in preload increases stroke volume, which increases the cardiac output. Contractility. This is known as the Frank Starling law of the heart. As blood fills the left ventricle, it stretches the muscle fiber. The stretch of the muscle fiber determines the force available to eject the blood from the ventricle. You need to know there is a limit to the Frank Starling law. Afterload is the resistance in the aorta that must be overcome by contraction of the left ventricle to eject the blood. High diastolic blood pressure creates high afterload, which increases myocardial workload. Over time, this high afterload can lead to left ventricular failure, okay? The blood pressure, you got high blood pressure, it's gonna lead to left ventricular failure. <coughs> All right, factors that increase cardiac output, increase heart rate, increase blood volume, increased myocardial contractility, the sympathetic nerve stimulation, all right, beta-1 stimulation from epinephrine and a low blood pressure. Your blood pressure drops, your heart rate's going to pick up to compensate from it, for it. All right, factors that decrease cardiac output. Decrease heart rate, decrease blood volume, decrease myocardial contractivity. The parasympathetic nervous system stimulation. Beta-1 blockades, which are beta blockers, they all end, if you see this medicine, and the generic form, it usually ends in OL, OL. They're alls. And a higher diastolic blood pressure over time. Systemic vascular resistance is the resistance that is offered to blood flow through a vessel. As a vessel constricts, resistance inside the vessel increases, which typically increases pressure inside the vessel. Conversely, as a vessel dilates, Resistance inside the vessel decreases, which typically decreases pressure inside the vessel. 
Vasoconstriction is the term for a decrease in vessel diameter, and vasodilation is the term for an increase in vessel diameter. All right, sympathetic stimulation causes vasoconstriction, which decreases vessel diameter and increases the uh, systematic vascular resistance. Parasympathetic stimulation causes vasodilation, which increases vessel diameter and increases the systemic vascular resistance. Alpha-1 properties in norepinephrine and norepinephrine <coughs> released in response to sympathetic stimulation called vasoconstriction, which decreases vessel diameter and increases systemic vascular resistance. All right, your blood pressure is going to go up. Systolic blood pressure is the relative indicator of the cardiac output, whereas the diastolic blood pressure measures the systemic vascular resistance. If the systolic blood pressure is decreasing, it is an indication of a diminished cardiac output. The pulse pressure is the difference between the systolic and the diastolic pressure readings. A narrow pulse pressure is defined as being less than 25% of the systolic blood pressure. This is not a lot of stuff you're probably going to have to know at this level. Microcirculation is the flow of blood through the smallest blood vessels. These are the arterioles, the capillaries, and the venules. The true capillaries are the site of exchange of nutrients, oxygen, carbon dioxide, glucose, waste products, and metabolic substances between the blood and the cells. Meta-arterioles are described as thoroughfares or channels that connect the arterioles and the venules. <coughs> All right, some of the factors that can influence your microcirculation, okay? Temperature, if you get cold, your blood goes where? To your, to your core, okay? Hypoxia, what does hypoxia mean? Not enough oxygen. Not enough oxygen, okay? If you don't have enough oxygen going in, where's your blood gonna go? Is it going to um, oxygenate your fingers and toes, or is it going to oxygenate your liver and your lungs and your heart? Your main, your main, your organs. main organs, okay? All right, you have some neural factors, which is your sympathetic nervous system and parasympathetic nervous system, and some hormonal factors, uh, factors which is uh, your alpha-1 receptors. All right, the body's com uh, compensatory mechanisms are geared towards maintaining pressure inside the vessel and perfusion of the cells. That's what you need to know about this. The body's compensata uh, compensatory mechanisms are geared towards maintaining pressure inside the vessel and perfusion to the cell. Perfusion of cells is linked to your blood pressure. To maintain adequate perfusion, the blood must be pushed with enough force to constantly deliver oxygen and glucose to the cells and remove those waste products. The general effect of blood pressure on perfusion is an increased blood pressure increases cellular perfusion. A decreased blood pressure decreases cellular perfusion. Okay? So, if you have a Normal blood pressure or a high blood pressure, you're going to increase that cellular perfusion. If you have a low blood pressure, it's going to decrease. Baroreceptors are stretch sensitive receptors located in the aortic arch and the carotid sinuses that direct changes in blood pressure. As the pressure inside the vessel changes, it decreases or increases the stretch of the fibers of the baroreceptors. The baroreceptors Having detected this change in blood pressure, send impulses to the cardioregulatory center in the medulla of the brainstem to make alterations in the blood pressure. The cardioregulatory center increases the heart rate and force of myocardial contraction, uh, <clears throat> which increases sympathetic nervous system impulses to the heart and reduces the parasympathetic nervous system. Okay, the sympathetic nervous system is gonna increase your blood pressure, it's gonna increase your heart rate, 
It's gonna increase your respiratory rate. The parasympathetic is gonna decrease everything. All right. <clears throat> Simulation from the chemoreceptors to change the cardiovascular system occurs only when there is a significant change in oxygen or carbon dioxide content in the arterial blood. If the patient becomes hypoxic due to an acute allergic reaction, What's going to be the response of the heart rate? Is it going to increase, decrease, stay the same? Okay. What's going to happen to their blood pressure? Down. Their blood pressure is going to go down. Okay. That's another reason why the heart rate increases. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Aerobic metabolism, got to have oxygen, got to have a patent airway, must have minute ventilation, which is your tidal volume and your respiratory, ventilatory rate. Jesus, it helps if I could talk. You must have alveolar ventilation, which is also your ventilatory rate and your tidal volume. Perfusion to the pulmonary capillaries. You have to have gas exchange between the capillaries and the alveoli. And you have to, have to, have to have the red blood cells with the hemoglobin and the iron and the plasma. Cardiac output is determined by heart rate, your preload, how much uh, volume is coming into the heart, all right? Your stroke volume, myocardial contractility, how much the heart is contracted or how forceful the heart is contracted and the afterload, which is how much blood is coming out of the heart. Systemic vascular resistance and gas exchange between the capillaries and the cells. All right. The patient has a history of chronic obstructive lung disease and heart failure. He's been increasingly short of breath for two days with a sudden worsening today. With the assistance of the engine crew, patting gusts, continue assisting the patient's ventilations and providing supplemental oxygen. The crew recognizes the seriousness of this patient condition and is prepared to take further measures as needed to maintain the patient's airway. Gus calls a report to the receiving hospital. When they arrive at the emergency department, a physician, a nurse, and a respiratory therapist are waiting to continue the patient's care. I'm just gonna tell you that never happened. Okay, just FYI. All right, so what do cells have to have to work? Oxygen. And? Glucose. Glucose. All right. All right. That's it for that one. 